Tom is head of the Energy and Environment Division at the International Energy Agency, and the title of his talk is CCUS in the Clean Energy Transition. Over to you, Tom. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sara, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, good morning to you. Thank you for joining so early uh, US time. Here at the IEA, we uh, review all aspects of, of the energy sector um, and uh, produce lots of data and reports and publications on the policy side, the technology side, and uh, I, I might start off with one of our most recent uh, and well-publicized reports, which is uh, our Net Zero report, which came out just a few weeks ago. Here, the, the IEA made it clear that uh, there can be feasible pathways to, net, to achieving global net zero emissions by 2050. That was the headline. Um, it's one pathway, and obviously there are an infinite number of pathways, depending on countries, circumstances, wealth, resources, and so on. Um, so that's a, a, a caveat with our scenario, but really the point is that it's feasible uh, and we can start now implementing a range of different policies to, to deliver on it. We start off with a, a story of, of what, the different, what the trend might look like in terms of the different pathways over the decades. And here we see first the breakdown in terms of the fuel pathways, uh, going decade by decade up to 2050. And we see clearly the expected uh, reduction in fossil fuel consumption uh, over, the, over those decades, uh, completed with, with the, the growth of, of CCUS in that pathway. Similarly, on the electricity side, we, we split out the electricity side because a major element, a, a near no regrets element of all decarbonization scenarios is growing electrification of the energy sector. Uh, so looking at how that sector changes within the, the different decades here as well, we see not only the growth, but the changing composition away from the, the today's where we have a, a vast bulk of, of unabated fossil fuels to the, the growth, the huge growth clearly of, of solar and wind and other renewables, but also the growth of, of CCUS in the power sector. So power sector, it started off being talked of just in power, uh, the talk in recent years has also stretched into industry and other sectors, um, and it will be, a, in, in our scenario, it's a component of, of all three sectors. Not least because, as you'll see here, we, by 2050, there's quite a significant hydrogen consumption uh, in our scenario, uh, and that's partly delivered through uh, what people call green hydrogen, so produced through electrolyzers using uh, renewably sourced electricity, um, but there's also the blue hydrogen in there, the hydrogen that's produced with fossil fuels or synthetic fuels combined with CCUS. So uh, it's, CCUS is relevant in, in every part of, of that chain. Yes. Here we see how significant, insignificant it is uh, by today's standards compared to where it got to grow to uh, in 2050. So in terms of the story of the scale, uh, here we get some, some very big numbers and some very strong growth rates. And here again, you see the different breakdown of of where in our scenario we would expect to see the growth of, of, of this uh, of CCS. Um, there's still a lot, uh, clearly a lot in the electricity sector, but as I was saying, it's in electricity, it's in industry, it's in fuel supply that I mentioned hydrogen, but it's also in, in the, the biofuels side um, where uh, it can lead to negative emissions, of course, when we combine that with, with, uh, with bioenergy and, and carbon capture. Uh, and then there's DAX as well, to, to, if you like, the, the cherry on the top is that there is DAX in this as well. So that's, uh, again, a detailed breakthrough, look through uh, the, the pathway, uh, the scale, and where we're expecting CCUS to grow. Uh, and given that it's a, it's a hot topic, we thought it's, it's worth touching base with, with other scenarios around the world. And in particular, given the, the, the climate discussions focus on all of this, how things stand of comparing our scenario compared to other scenarios. So here, we just flag up what our scenario looks like compared to um, the, the, the vast range of other com comparable scenarios from the IPCC report. And to pick up uh, CC, uh, CO2 capture in particular, you'll see that we are very much erring on the conservative side. We, we do so also when it comes to CO2 removal um, and with bioenergy supply. And we're higher than most scenarios when it comes to hydrogen supply. So that's, it's a, an interesting litmus test of, of, of where we stand compared to everybody else. 
But then if, if we go back to, uh, to the question of scale, if this is what we are putting in our scenario, then, uh, and that's conservative, then uh, that means that the, the numbers, when you look beyond the energy sector, uh, grow even larger. That's something to bear in mind, friends, that this, our scenario is, is focusing on the energy sector and achieving net zero in the energy sector in 2050. When one takes global scenarios of global emissions, uh, it's as often as not, there are um, scenarios which require more to be done in the energy sector to compensate for the, the, the great difficulties in delivering uh, carbon re reductions in other sectors. And that can lead to requiring more negative emissions in the energy sector and therefore more, more CCUS. So that's one reason why we're being conservative. But uh, again, the scale uh, is pretty, pretty great. The rates of growth are pretty great, all things considered. So those are the projections. Um, let's have a look at where we've gone in, in recent, uh, recent years. And here, the, the growth rates are not quite the same. You'll see, starting from a, a relatively low base in, in 1980, according to our data, um, most of the development, most of the projects have, have been associated with natural gas processing. And then more latterly, um, very recently, in fact, we've had projects that have, have, have uh, been developed in other sectors, in fertilizer, tin fuel power generation, and so on. So it's very much at the demonstration phase, but these are projects I guess a lot of you are familiar with, and it's, it's necessary to have, given the, the diversity of the applications of, of this technology, um, it's, there's, there's le fresh learning curves in, in practically every sector. So we need to start off with the, with the demonstrations to just be, before there's any, any hope of, of repetition of, the, of this project in, in, in the same sectors. So that's the starting point. And clearly we see 2020 has been a big jump. And that's one of the, the interesting policy mes messages that comes out, I guess, that uh, with, with the, 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 the global talks growing more serious around COP26 and, and global commitments to net zero, and I think there are now uh, 57 uh, commitments around the world to, to, to net zero emissions by 2050, um, that kind of uh, strong, credible policy message is, is building confidence in the sector. And so we're getting greater numbers of project proposals and announcements, funding announcements, and support as well. Scaling up, we've had, we have some experience of it. I, I showed the graph there of, of trends over the last 40 years or so. And here, there, there is some of the, the classic lessons you'd expect to come out of a, an embryonic industry. There's learning by doing, questions of the, uh, the different players are, are learning about when it comes to, to, to site layout and to modularization, to, to breaking it down not treating CCUS all as, as, as one indigestible whole, but breaking it down into its component parts makes everything much more uh, comprehensible and, and more really easily scaled up bit by bit. Then there's the research element that goes into it. This is clearly one of the, 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 the technologies which still requires major research investments and innovations. In fact, we, we've said for, for our uh, net zero scenario that um, almost half the emissions reductions that we need to deliver on the net zero scenario are coming from technologies which are uh, immature, not yet commercial, and need, need major in innovation and R&D investment to, to support them to get through the, the valleys of death and, and to start to scale up and to bring down costs. So here we've got some experience, and as I mentioned, a big jump in 2020. So we had more than 30 new project announcements and over 8 billion US dollars committed to to, to projects and, and their development. Um, and with some of these projects, we, we are seeing major, major cost reductions. Some, de depending on what we compare with what, um, we've, we've seen reductions of 20%, 35%. In some cases, new projects doing what was done only a few years ago have achieved a 70% reduction. Now, obviously, this can still be very much case specific. Um, so we can't hope for ongoing 70% cost reductions uh, annually for, for, for years. Um, so in our scenario, we, we actually assumed minus 35% cost uh, learning, learning, learning factor and cost reduction over the years. But that's, that's what can come from, from scaling up. The other aspect to mention in terms of scaling up and, and learning is the, the, the impact on operating costs as opposed to capital costs. So here again, optimizing of, of maintenance strategies, uh, resource use, 
um, can play a great role in, in reducing costs, um, whether it's, well, I, I won't go into the risks, going into the dangers of technicalities here of increased uh, compression efficiency and digitalization and so on, but these are the, these are the types of things that are being developed as new projects uh, are being planned and announced and, and, and set up. Uh, and all of these can have significant impact on, on costs. So the scaling up will help in terms of learning, it helps in terms of capital cost reduction, and it helps in terms of operating costs. The other aspect to flag up in terms of scale and cost reduction is the Im improvement in business models that comes with learning. Again, breaking it down into the separate components of capture, transport, and storage uh, really allows us to zoom in on the different elements of, of the different parts of the, of the, of the value chain. Um, for instance, shared transport and storage infrastructure costs is, is one element which has had a lot of news recently. The, uh, the Europeans have created, for instance, a, a, a port hydrogen hub, which is bringing together uh, industrial hubs with a range of different expertise and skills and existing infrastructure and get, thinking all of that through to work together as a, as a hub for, for, for new hydrogen sources uh, combined with CCOS and, and storage and transport options. So, bringing together different players to, to, to have that kind of hub thinking is another factor that can, can be bringing, bringing costs down in the scaling up. So those are a few of the factors that we, we highlight in, uh, in our report. The report we produced last year was a, a, a zoom in on, on everything you wanted to know about CCUS around the world, uh, the technologies, the, the different cost aspects and, and the policy story. Yeah. Looking at where we, um, where we expect the the, the accelerated CCUS to, to happen. This is just a look at uh, a different improvement by 2030. And here we see the, uh, the, 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 the growth factors up by, by a factor of, of 20. Um, it's a mix. There's still, as I mentioned, uh, quite a lot in, in the power sector. So significant retrofitting uh, of existing power, uh, but also of industrial plants. One of the one of the questions that the world faces uh, as we decarbonize is what to do with existing infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of existing new infrastructure and particularly in, in Asia, there's a lot of existing pretty new infrastructure, which has to be retrofitted or repurposed uh, or converted for it to be, uh, um, for not to end up being a, a, a major risk and stranded asset uh, and yet being part of a, a decarbonization strategy. Then there's the question of how does all of this happen? And given it's, it's uh, the, the state of play, there's multiple elements that a, a government can bring to, to making this happen. It's government combined with cooperation with industry, of course. And here, given the, the timing that people are now talking of, given the, the focus on, on net zero by 2050, and that's, that's global. So that re it requires that some countries will be faster, some will slower. And for the faster country, that means delivering net zero or even negative emissions well before uh, 2050. Uh, so that means there's plenty of room for CCOs to play a role in different pathways of different countries around the world, even before 2050. But for that to happen, uh, we need urgent action in terms of setting up the right frameworks, uh, the, creating the right commission conditions for investment. And that includes putting a value on emissions reductions using carbon pricing or or some, some other form of, of, of giving a, a value on, on, that, on those reductions, providing funding, and whether that's uh, su support, tax, tax breaks, uh, contract for different regimes, uh, other forms of subsidies. This is still necessary for, for demonstration plants getting moving forward. Uh, but also there needs to be a good discussion about the, the, the legal and the regu regulatory frameworks around all of this. Uh, some of the issues, um, we've, we've thought through in, in, in other fields, in, in, in the, or the oil and the mining industries, for instance, some of these areas of these issues have been addressed, but this needs adaptation to the, to the world of, of, of CCUS. So uh, there needs to be an exploration of the different aspects of the legal and regulatory regimes associated with the geology or, or the particular areas we're talking of. Uh, and associated with that is the, the question of, of, of judging the risk, calculating the risk, and allocating the risk. Some of these risks are things that can be monetized and, and borne through insurance and the private sector. Others may be for, for the government to bear. So all of these issues need, need thinking through. Then there's the question of, 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 of targeting the development of industrial hubs. I mentioned the, the example in the EU of, of, of ports and, and hydrogen and, and storage and, and transport issues. 
being grouped together. Um, so it's a matter of identifying those, those kinds of opportunities and, and deploying uh, CCS in cooperation with industry, uh, discovering those regions, um, and also building up the, the business model to, uh, to, to allow that there can be development of, of capture. Separately, there can be development of storage. But at the same time, we need to ensure that there are the transport or the transport infrastructure uh, there to, to ensure that these, these different parts of the market are able to interact and we do actually create a market with the right infrastructure. So then, yes, I list here again the, the, the questions of, of storage, um, looking at the geological aspects. Again, there's a lot of experience uh, in, in, the, in the mining oil and gas industry, which can be transposed into this. So that's a, another aspect we talk about in terms of the scaling up is the fact that um, there's a lot of job, job repurposing in the industry to, to help deal with these issues. Uh, and then there's just a the question of, of, of boosting innovation again, the, 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 the need to support through ongoing R&D uh, of the development of new technologies um, and to accelerate the, the different sub, uh, sub components, the key applications of different technologies. Again, whether that's in the, the capture aspect, storage, the transport, and so on. So that's a quick run through the, the, the scale, the, the, the overall big picture uh, that we're talking of, the comparison with historical developments, and a look at, at how that can change and how that indeed is already changing, and then a look at both where that's going to happen and the policy measures that we need to support that scaling up. I think I'll leave it there, happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So the first question, you had a chart earlier in your presentation that showed most of the CCS that's been done to date has been in the area of gas processing. Yet most of the CO2 um, that's being emitted is actually from combustion flue gas. So in terms of their learning by doing, how much does the learning that's been accomplished in gas processing help us do combustion of uh, flue gas CO2 capture? I, I wouldn't put a number on it. Um, it's in broad terms when there's there's learning from 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 the oil and gas sectors today um but how 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 replicable that is how much uh thinking an adaptation that needs given the different geological circumstances or the or the changes that's uh it's i guess the point is that we're we're not starting at zero um so there's there's, there's not com complete learning to be done um, but yes, there is an, an adaptation in the thinking or adaptation to, to local circumstances. Um, you, you mentioned also that half of CCUS gains are going to come from technologies that are not fully mature. So who do you see will enable the de-risking of these technologies as it will uh, entail significant funding? Uh, well, there's a, there's a wealth of, of policy instruments to talk about there in terms of, of sharing that risk. Um, and it can, it can come partly through, through non monetary measures through improving the regulatory environment, improving the policy environment. I mean, already the, the jump we've had in 2020 comes really from a, a sense that pure in pure political terms, uh, big players around the world are taking this much more seriously than hitherto. So that, that already is providing a reassurance to the industry that this is not uh, an extravagant folly, that this is, this is a, a clear direction of travel. And in fact, it's a direction of travel which is unchangeable and, and getting faster. And that's just from, from, policy, from political messaging. Uh, so a lot can be done with that policy messaging. Then there's the regulatory framework. And the more we can create uh, uh, a regulatory framework that answers a lot of industry's questions, whether that's in terms of, of, uh, of liability um, or the, the other aspects of the regulatory regime, that as well will have a direct impact on project costs, on, on project risk assessment and lower, lower the capital costs of the development. And then there's just, there is the money um, that, that comes from the, the wealth of different instruments we have. In some places, we've got uh, uh, good clear carbon prices, which are providing a, a signal. Um, but in most, most places, it, 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 everywhere, in fact, for these types of technologies, that kind of uh, carbon pricing signal must be combined with other forms of support. You've got a, a, good, a good regime in, in, in the US in terms of tax breaks support um, with, with the Californian scheme or, or the federal scheme. These, these are good initiatives which have, have monetized that, uh, that support and, and made it a, a broadly successful instrument. Um, and then there's pure research funding that, that uh, uh, again, the, the, the US is, is putting billions into um, to, to, to drive forward more of the, the, the primary research. So 
basic, I think, whether we're talking CCUS or, or other uh, novel technologies, it's really a matter of every type of instrument being necessary. Um, there are good practices around the world of different instruments that work. So there's really not a, a shortage of, of different instruments to apply. Um, and all of them, whether they're political, policy, long-term vision, regulatory, legal, or financial, all of them need application. And um, storage is something that's not been discussed much in this seminar so far. So I'm talking geologic storage here. How do you see public concerns about storage, you know, sort of NIMBY, leakage issues, things like that being addressed when we have a whole lot of opposition to even things like enhanced electrical grids and offshore wind? Um, those kinds of infrastructure, which are sort of considered climate friendly, um, are getting a lot of opposition. So, you know, where does geologic storage fit in and how are we going to deal with public perception issues there? Well, in that sense, it's 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 a bit like your 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 other example. It's it's a it's a very well known issue and barrier to any kind of change and in innovation. Uh, we have some degree of, of of learning about how to deal with these issues, um, in terms of trying to explain, trying to to develop local policies that bring in local communities to make sure that there's a dialogue with all relevant stakeholders, that we can put as much information out there as you possibly can to try to, to, to educate and inform. Uh, so this is the case, it's, it's the case with, with, with well, with all, all technologies. Um, it's, it's, it's growing as, as awareness and as the, the, the sense of scale of, of CCUS uh, grows, then it, it is a growing issue in, in terms of storage here. Um, but the, the messages, the, the, the concerns, if you like, are the same and the, the tools of addressing them are the same. It requires engagement, it requires putting the information out there, uh, it requires demonstration to show that the, the, the risks that are purportedly out there are, are not there or, or not as great or manageable, um, and that we can have the reassuringly robust re regulatory or legal or financial liability relationships there that can address them. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you very much for your talk.